I turned around. That was weird. Stand with me if you would. Take a hymn book. Let's turn to page 337. Since I have been redeemed, I have a song I love to sing. Let's stand to sing. I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name, since I I have a home prepared. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed. Where I shall dwell eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. I will glory in his name since I I will glory in my Savior's name. Amen. Well, good to see you tonight. Glad you're here with us. And uh, if you saw back in the back, the kids are having a good time tonight. Shark night back there. And so pray they have a good time. And pray the Lord uses that too during the lesson time uh, that he speaks to their hearts. Well, let's start with a word of prayer tonight. And uh, Brother Pat, would you mind praying for us? Amen. You may be seated.
right, take your hymn books again. Stand with me if you would. 579, we are your church. Let's stand to sing. God has built his church on one foundation. Jesus Christ, the living cornerstone, crucified and risen to redeem us. We adore and worship him alone. We are your church, your bride, the people of your name and your strength we live. We worship unashamed for your cause we serve. We joyfully proclaim we are your people, we are your church, set apart to serve our loving Savior, given power to share redemption's plan. We will tell the world the love of Jesus, we will preach the cross to every land, we are your Unashamed for your cause we serve, we joyfully proclaim we are your people, we are your church. With a shout, the bridegroom is returning, heaven's prince will come to claim his own. We will rise to reign with him forever. We will see. Amen. Well, men, if you'd come, we'll take this evening's tithes and offerings. And uh, we mentioned several re requests this morning. Remember, uh, Darlene in prayer, and of course, Colette in prayer. Uh, both of them have surgery this week. And then, of course, remember Trent in prayer and his family, uh, as his dad went to be with the Lord this week. Are there any other uh, requests we can bring to the Lord tonight? Yes, Kyra. Um, my mom's getting ready for surgery. Okay, let's pray for Kyra's mom then, okay? All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer then. And uh, Nathan, would you mind praying for us? Maybe seated.
right. Well, it is good to have a good friend with us tonight. Pastor Holman is here, and of course, he spoke at our uh, couples retreat just a couple weeks ago, and uh, excited to have him here with us tonight. I told him I should have just had him preach, and he said, well, these days I'm doing more singing at churches, and I said, well, uh, you don't call us, we'll call you, and get that, get that figured out one of these days, but uh, good to see him. Well, a uh, few announcements for you tonight. Reminder, next week uh, is our Revival Week, and I am really looking forward to that. That'll be all day Sunday, Sunday school, Sunday morning, and then the evening. And then Monday through Wednesday, we'll meet at 7 o'clock each night and uh, just have a good time around God's Word. Brother Rand Hummel will be with us, and uh, he will be an encouragement to you. And then a couple of uh, announcements for baby showers. We have a couple of baby boys on the way, and it used to be we could not get boys around here. It was all girls. And uh, when I was youth pastor, I said, that's not a problem. If the girls are here, the boys will come. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do now that we only have boys. So uh, we've got a baby shower for Robert and Alyssa, and that'll be on October 26th here from 3 to 6. And if you could RSVP either through email or I think they have a sign up back in the back, uh, they would appreciate that. And then Pastor Joe and Samantha, they are having a little boy, and that will be on, uh, well, not the baby, the baby shower will be on uh, November 16th here at the church at 11, all right? And then just a couple quick reminders, if you are still interested in going to Louisville with our Senior Saints for that uh, dinner show that we're going to down there, uh, sign up on the back, there's an information sheet, and we have to have that locked in by the end of October uh, so we can lock in our hotel rooms, and that will be a good time. And then also a reminder, we have our Operation Christmas Child back in the back, and so I know many of you have been uh, giving towards that faithfully all year, and as we get down to the end, we have actual uh, shoe boxes back there. Feel free to take one of those, and you can fill up a whole box uh, yourself, and uh, we'll get those shipped out, and, and appreciate all that Amy and Debbie do with that, all right? Well, I think that is all the announcements for tonight, so Chuck, if you'd come, read us one more song. All right, take your hymn books to 122. Let's stand again and sing Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Aren't you thankful for that? Page 122. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our
moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Thank you for that this evening. It's always good to have Jocelyn back home, and the uh, Lord has gifted her musically, and now she's learning guitar. That's in the last couple years, and uh, just uh, love to see how she's using that for the Lord, and uh, thank you mu very much for that tonight. Well, we're in Hebrews chapter 3, if you'd join me, Hebrews chapter 3, as we're con continuing our series through the book, kind of going verse by verse, and the title of our series is Jesus is Greater, and you remember the reason for that is because this is written to Jews that had followed Christ, and now they are weighing the cost that uh, is taking on them, and they're contemplating turning their back on Christ and going back to Judaism. And uh, the author is basically saying this. He says, you need to remember that Christ is greater than anything you have come from, and he's greater than anything you could go back to. And so the theme of the book of Hebrews is Christ is greater. And he's comparing him to all these different things, and tonight we're going to be in a, uh, one of seven warning sections in the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in verse 7 of chapter 3. We'll begin. It says this. It says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation and the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, therefore, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, 
lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginnings of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Let's go to the Lord and ask him to be with us tonight. Lord, we thank you for uh, just the good day we've had today. We thank you for the way that you've worked. I thank you for uh, Karen joining the church this morning and just the uh, thrill that is. And and uh, just for the uh, good things that you allow us to be part of, we thank you for it. And Lord, I pray that you would help us tonight to examine our hearts, that we do not have a hard hearts, but hearts that are tender towards you, that are receptive, uh, that are anxious to obey and willing to trust. And just uh, be with us tonight. Help it to be a good time uh, of self-evaluation through your word. We thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, have you ever ignored a warning before? Uh, I may have told you once before about the guy out in Westminster, California, that uh, he was fed up with all the cockroaches that were in his apartment, so he decided to get some bug bombs to uh, get rid of them, and, and uh, the label said they suggested that you get two bug bombs to do that. He figured if two was good, then 25 would be better. And so he got 25 bug bombs, put them in his apartment, set them all off, and when the fumes of those bombs reached the pilot light on the stove, it said that it blew off the front screen door of his house, it broke all the windows, and it caused $10,000 worth of damage in his house because he ignored the warning. My favorite part of that story is this. He said within a week, he saw all the cockroaches were back. <laughs> uh, I tell you, uh, sometimes we ignore warnings. Sometimes we're thankful for warnings. You ever been pulled over and just gotten a warning when you really deserved a ticket before? Uh, I see some guilty faces out there. I remember, uh, uh, or Sarah, do you remember this? When we were, you don't have to be laughing about it. We were coming back from uh, college one time, Christmas break, I think it was, and we came uh, from Madison, Wisconsin area all the way down, came down through 65 down to Indy, and uh, the speed limit was 70, so I was going 75, you know, obeying the law, and, and uh, came down through Indy, and somewhere through that, that switched from being 70 miles an hour to 55 miles an hour, and I didn't know it, and I was still going 75. And we're going through there, and a cop pulls us over right down there, 65, and uh, came to the window, and he, he was not happy, was he? He was, he was an, uh, I think I interrupted his donut break or something. I don't know what I did, but uh, he came, and he just, uh, he kind of led into me, didn't he? And he, 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 you know how fast you were going, and, and it's 20 miles over, which means it kicks it to the next level, and you're going to go to prison for life, and, and all that sort of thing. And, and uh, he finished the rant, and finally he looked at me, and he took my license, and he gave it back to me, and he said, well, don't do it anymore. And I said, Phew. Uh, what a relief. You've been there before? Uh, really, in this passage, what Christ is doing, what God is doing, is he is giving us a warning. Uh, there are seven times to the book of Hebrews that uh, the author kind of stops what he is talking about, and he pulls over, and he, he says, let me, let me lovingly and compassionately warn you about some pitfalls that could take place in your life. Uh, you remember in chapter 2, Pastor Joey preached on the first one. It was the the, the warning of drifting through life without ever attaching yourself to Christ. Uh, just kind of wandering through life without ever taking time to, to make sure your relationship is what it needs to be with the Lord. And, and here he gives us a second warning. The warning he gives us here is he gives us the warning of a hard heart. He talks to us about uh, the danger as believers and how dangerous it can be to allow our hearts to become cold and to become hard. I want to give you four thoughts this evening. First of all, I'd like you to see a plea to avoid a hard heart. A plea to avoid a hard heart. We see in verse 7, it says this. It says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear my voice, harden not your hearts. I love this little phrase right here. Did you notice what he said? He introduces it by saying, as the Holy Ghost saith. Uh, what's he talking about? Has he just forgotten what Old Testament author had written this passage, and so he's just uh, covering himself by saying it was written by the Holy Ghost? No. Uh, this man was very well versed in the Old Testament. What he is doing is he is reminding us that this is the Word of God. Uh, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. It is inspired by God, and I like what he says here. 
But notice what he says, as the Holy Ghost, what's that next word? Saith. He doesn't say, as the Holy Ghost said. He says, as the Holy Ghost saith. Uh, not a past tense, but a present tense. Uh, that's very important, because that, that means the Holy Spirit is still speaking to us through his word. You realize that whenever you open God's word, whether it's through preaching or through your devotions, that it is the Lord that is speaking to you. And sometimes he will speak to you and he will comfort you and he will encourage you. Sometimes he will speak to you and he will challenge you and convict you. Uh, sometimes he will give you uh, wisdom and discernment about situations in your life. But when you open the word of God, what you are doing is you are allowing God to speak to you. He doesn't say it was past tense. He says it is present tense. He says, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear my voice, harden not your hearts. Here he reminds us of what it is the Holy Spirit is saying. What is it that the Holy Spirit wants to say to us tonight? Well, what he is doing is he is pleading with us not to allow our hearts to become hard. He says, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. What is a hard heart? Uh, the best definition I found was this. A hard heart is one that continually refuses to trust God when tested and obey God when ordered. Let me say that again. A hard heart is one that continually refuses to trust God when tested and obey God when ordered. At our house, I, uh, Isaac, several months ago, he was uh, running into the house and he took the big uh, uh, main door and he swung it open too hard. I didn't have a door stop there and it it put a big old hole right in the uh, wall in our living room. I've been putting that project off and off and off. And so uh, Monday was the day to finally get it uh, patched up. And so I went to our little utility room and I had a, a five gallon bucket of mud. And I went to that thing and I took the lid off and looked at that mud and it was just as hard and as dry as could be. I mean, the, the little mud blade couldn't penetrate it. You couldn't work with it. You, it had no pliability to it. And, and that's the idea here. A hard heart is the idea of a, a heart that will not respond the right way. It's hardened. It's impenetrable. It won't allow God to work with it. And some of you, you may be finding in your life it is becoming more and more difficult to feel anything in your spiritual life. You can come to a, a worship service and, and nothing moves you. You come to church and you hear the music and the preaching and, and you've, you've heard it all before. You find it harder and harder to make time to be in God's word. And, and when you are in God's word, it seems like it's dry and, and like you get nothing out of it. It could be that you have a, a waning desire to talk to God. And when you do talk to God, it feels just as if you're going through the motions. If you are there, that, that is a danger zone because you are in danger of developing what the word of God calls a hard heart. A place where you find it more and more difficult to say yes to God. A place where you find it more and more difficult to trust God in your life. And here the Holy Spirit pleads with us. He says, hear his voice today. Do not harden your heart. We see a, a plea to avoid a hard heart. And then in verses 8 through 11, we see a picture of a hard heart. You see, in verses 7 through 11, he, he gives us this illustration of Israel. He says, do you want to see what it looks like to have a hard heart? Then let me show you a group of people that hardened their hearts against God. You see, they hardened their hearts against God, and you can see that in the way that they refused to trust God when they were tested. Look at verse 8. He says, harden not your hearts as in the day, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Here he is talking about the Israelites in the wilderness. Some believe this is a reference to the time when they did not have water. And, and instead of trusting God, they chose to harden their hearts and complain against God. That very well could be. Others say this whole section, verses 9 all the way down through 15, is, is reference to the point where they were about to enter to the promised land. And God said, I, I want you to go, and I want you to take this land. And they went in, and they spied it out, and, and they saw everything that God had promised, but they also saw the giants in the land, and they saw the size of the walls in the land, and, and they came back, and they said, we are but grasshoppers in their sights, and, and they saw the size of the giants instead of the size of their God, and they did not trust the Lord. He says they had a hard heart. 
You know, it's interesting. Testing, it can either draw us closer to God or it can drive us away from God. I've heard it said that the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. Can I say this? If, if you are going through a time of testing in your life right now, you need to know that you will not come out of that the same person you were when you went into it. You will either come out of that time of testing with a heart that is more tender and more trusting towards God, or you're going to come out of it with a heart that is more hardened and skeptical towards God. If you think about it, if anyone should have trusted the Lord, it was this generation. What had they just seen? They had just been in Israel or in, in Egypt. And they had seen God come and bring the ten plagues. And, and they saw how God brought the plagues on the Egyptians, and yet he stopped them in Goshen so that they were protected. Uh, they had just seen how, how God had brought them out and, and had brought them up to the, the water's edge, and they were trapped with nowhere to go. And they saw God split the sea, and, and they walked across on dry ground. And then God used that same sea to take out their enemy. If anyone should have been able to trust God, it should have been them. They should have been able to look back on God's goodness and God's faithfulness and realize that he was trustworthy, and yet they didn't. Can I remind you of this? There is something about remembering God's goodness in our past that keeps our hearts tender. There is something about remembering his faithfulness and the way that he has saved us and the way that he has cared for us in the past that keeps our hearts from becoming hard. This morning, our uh, our message was a, uh, almost a straight salvation message. And one of my favorite things about the day is when the uh, service was over, I was back in the back, Connie came up to me and she said, uh, she said, it never gets old. And she was talking about the gospel. She was talking about no matter how long you have been saved, it's a story that you want to hear over and over again if your heart is soft. You don't want to forget what God has done for you. You don't want your, your salvation to be something that is dull and, and white noise in your life. He says, uh, these people, they should have known that God was faithful. They should have remembered that God was good, but they didn't. We sing a song here at church quite often. It's called, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, an old hymn of the faith. And uh, for years, there is a line in that hymn uh, that I had no clue what it meant. In the middle of that hymn, there's a little phrase that says, here I raise mine Ebenezer. Do you remember that phrase? And uh, we would always sing that song, and I thought, what? And the, I would think of Scrooge when I heard Ebenezer. That's all that came to my mind. Well, recently I was studying this out. Do you, do you know what that is? you know what that phrase is? That phrase is from a time when Israel had an upset victory over the Philistines. And what Samuel did is he went and he built an altar and he named the altar Ebenezer. The word Ebenezer literally means, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. In other words, in future generations, when, when Israel was tempted to doubt God's goodness, they could go back and they could look at God's faithfulness and they can be reminded of God's goodness and it can keep their hearts tender and trusting towards God. Can I say this? I, I think we should have some Ebenezer moments in our life, shouldn't we? You should be able to look back on times in your life and remember when God was faithful. Remember at times when, when you didn't think you were going to make it and yet God was good. Uh, times where, where you didn't think you would be able to make it through it and yet you found that he was more than enough. We need to be able to remember God's goodness because there's something about remembering God's goodness in our past that keeps our hearts tender towards him. Israel, they, they refused to trust God when they were tested, but they also refused to obey God when they were ordered. Look at verse 10. He says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Here again, he, he makes the comparison of these people coming into the promised land. He, he tells them, he says, I, I want you to go into the promised land. I want you to take the land that I have given you. And again, remember, they looked at the size of the giants instead of the size of their gods. And, and what do they do? They say, uh, it's not so bad right here where we are. I don't know that we want to go and face those giants. I don't know that we want to step out in faith. And, and instead of choosing to obey God, they chose to resist God. Can I ask you this question? 
Is there something in your life that you know God is wanting to do, you to do, but you are refusing to do it? Is there a, a relationship that you know he is calling you to be the one to take that first step and restore, but, but you haven't been willing to take that step? Is there a, a sin in your life that he has convicted you of and you know you need to get rid of it, but, but you love it just a little bit too much so you, so you ignore it? Is there an area that he has called you to serve and to, to use your life in ministry and, and you just feel like now is not the right time, you have too much going on, and so you put it off? You know, every time we say no to the Lord, it becomes easier to say no to the Lord. Every time God convicts us and we suppress that, it, it becomes a little bit harder to hear him speak in our lives. Every time he, he speaks to us and we do not surrender, our, our hearts become a little less responsive. He told Israel, I want you to step out in faith, and I want you to obey, and instead of obeying, they resisted. That's a dangerous thing. I remember when I was a youth pastor, we took a teen retreat. We went up to uh, Chicago, uh, Illinois for a weekend. We did three or four days up there in the different amusement parks, and, and uh, Pastor Jeremiah came up. He was our speaker that week, and I think it was, I want to say it was Friday night was the last night of that teen uh, event, and and we're in a gym up there in Chicago, and he preached the message. And, and afterwards, there was a girl at the very top that uh, heard the message of, of salvation. The Lord got a hold of her heart, and she was just, uh, just under a lot of conviction. And I remember all the other kids left, and they were going back to the rooms to get ready for the night. And, and uh, this girl stayed in the bleachers, and she was just crying because she was just under such conviction. And some of the workers talked to her and, and explained it to her and talked through the gospel. And, and basically she said this. She said, I know God is calling me to get saved. But she said, if I get saved, I know I'm going to have to get rid of some of my friends that I have now. And she said, I'm not willing to do that. And so instead of being saved that night, she resisted the Lord. She didn't follow him. You know what's interesting? It, it wasn't long after that that she totally stopped coming to church. I see her around town uh, here and again, and, and to my knowledge, there has never been a time again where uh, she has responded to the Lord. You know, there's a, a danger when you say no to the Lord that, that you are presuming that you will have another chance to respond to the Lord. You're either presuming you will have more time, or you're presuming that he will speak to your heart again, and, and none, neither of those things are, are things that we have the right to. You see, they, they refused to trust God when they were tested. They refused to obey God when they were ordered. So we see here a picture of a hard heart. But third of all, I want you to see this, a prescription for a hard heart. A prescription for a hard heart. Look at verse 12. He says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. What is the prescription for a hard heart? How do we prevent a hard heart? How do we soften a heart that has become, began to become callous towards God? Well, the first thing we see is this. There needs to be examination. He says, take heed lest there be in any of you. Now, that's an interesting phrase that he puts in there. You know, there is not a one of us that is not susceptible to our hearts becoming hard towards God. It doesn't matter what uh, position you hold in the church, whether you're a deacon or you're on pastoral staff or you serve in Sunday school, there's not a one of us whose hearts cannot become cold and hard towards God. It doesn't matter if you've been saved for two months or for 20 years, all of us have hearts that can become hard. He says, therefore, he says, take heed. In other words, he says, look at your own hearts. Examine your hearts. See if there's something that is wrong in there. Uh, basically, he's saying, give yourself a spiritual EKG. Uh, ex uh, give an examination of your hearts. I came across these. These are not original with me, but uh, three diagno diagnostic questions to examine your heart. The first one is this. If you are looking to determine if you have a hard heart or not, ask this question. Is your heart cold? He says, do you continually feel yourself unmoved in the worship service? Do you find yourself tuning out to the preaching of God's word or to the testimony of others? He says, are there things that, that you would rather be doing than sitting in God's house and reading God's word and talking to God in prayer? Is your heart cold? Second question he says to ask is this, is your heart critical? Do you find yourself always criticizing other people? 
whether it be your spouse or your co-workers or your fellow church members, he says, do you find it difficult to overlook and to forgive the offenses of others? Do you find yourself being unthankful for the daily blessings that God has placed in your life? He says, examine your hearts. Has your heart become cold? Has it become critical? Third of all, he says, ask yourself, has your heart become cynical? Are you at a place where you assume the worst about others? Do you assume that no one cares about you or that, that others are trying to take advantage of you? Do you question the motives of other people? Is your focus always on your problems and, and the things that are wrong with your life? He says, take heed. Examine your hearts. You know your heart better than anyone else in this room knows your heart. He said, first of all, says, how do you deal with a hard heart? Number one, you examine it. Second of all, there needs to be exhortation. Look at verse 13. He says, but exhort one another daily while it is yet called today, lest any of you be hardened through deceitfulness of sin. Here he says that there needs to be exhortation. Uh, that's the idea that uh, as church brothers and sisters, we need to come alongside one another and challenge one another and help one another so that we do not allow each other to fall into the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, we need to help guard each other from having hard hearts. He describes sin here. He says that sin, it is deceitful. You know, sin, it is something that promises freedom, but it brings bondage. It is something that you think will bring pleasure, but really all it brings in the end is death. He says when you allow sin into your life, he says it will harden your hearts. Uh, the idea of a, a hot iron that, that is pressed on the skin, at first it will have extreme pain, but, but after a while it will become callous and it will, it will sear off the nerve endings. And he says that is how sin is. You allow it into your heart, you allow it into your life, and eventually you become hardened. So how do we keep from being overcome by the deceitfulness of sin? Well, one way is we come alongside one another. We love each other enough to protect each other. We encourage each other. We're not going to leave one another behind. He says there needs to be examination and there needs to be exhortation. Let me give you one last thought this evening. Number four, I'd like you to see a product of a hard heart. A product of a hard heart. Look at verse 14. We'll go down to the end of the chapter. He says, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginnings of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom he was grieved 40 years. Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Here we see that these men and women of Israel, they did not enter into rest. Their carcasses fell in the wilderness, it says, because of their unbelief. And really what he is saying here is he, he wanted so much more for their lives. Uh, these men and women that God brought to the promised land, he wanted to give them a life of victory. He wanted to give them a life where they could experience the blessings that only come through trusting God, and yet they would not trust him and they would not obey him. So instead of living that life, they lived a life where they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and literally they just wandered their life away. They saw no victories. Uh, they, saw, they did not see the blessings God wanted in their life. They wasted what God wanted to do. He said they could not enter in because of unbelief. I believe there's a couple of applications we can take from this here. One clearly would be for those that are not saved. Uh, the warning that, that not entering into eternal rest of heaven because of the sin of unbelief. And truly there is a danger when you harden yourself to the gospel of that. But I think primarily this section is talking to us as believers. He references here that, that he is talking to the brothers. And what he is saying is, uh, he is saying that uh, primarily, you are to have a hard heart. Do not waste your days on this earth by living with a hard heart. Uh, the key word in this passage would be the word today. Did you pick up on that? Uh, three different times he has verses that use the word today. You know, you think about that 
uh, bucket of mud that I had. How, how did it become so hard? I'll tell you, it became hard one day at a time. Uh, how do you develop a heart that is hard? You develop it one day at a time, one decision at a time. And what he's saying here is he's saying, today, if you hear my voice, harden not your hearts. I've heard it said that the most dangerous word in the English dictionary is the word tomorrow. Tomorrow is a thief that robs dreamers of dreams and the gifted of their accomplishments. Uh, many times we think that tomorrow will be the opportune time to do what God has called us to. And what God says is today is the opportune time to respond to what he's called us to. You see, if God has spoken to you about a specific area that needs change, uh, do not say, I will deal with that another day. Say, I will deal with it now and keep my heart soft. If God is, is pressing on your heart for some sort of ministry or, or some calling on your life, do not say, I will do that tomorrow. Say, today, I'm going to do it while it is yet called today. He tells us that today is the day of salvation. You're not guaranteed another opportunity to receive Christ. And, and if you tell the Lord no long enough, eventually he will just give us what we ask for. And so what he says here is this, as a, as a caretaker of your heart, do not put off till tomorrow what God has called you to do today. We delay trusting God in our trials, and, and to delay obeying God when he orders us is to risk hardening our hearts. Amen? Would you bow with me? Before we're dismissed this evening, I, I won't ask you to raise your hand or respond, but I will ask you to let the Lord speak to you. Can we just take a moment as a church and, and ask the Lord to help you take heed and to examine your own heart? If there's areas in your life that, that he is speaking to you and you have not been listening, if there are areas in your life that uh, he has called you to trust him, but you have not been trusting him, can you take a moment, you and the Lord, and ask him to work in your heart, if it's not where it needs to be, to soften your heart, to tender your heart, to help it become the heart that he can work with. Lord, we come to you tonight, and we thank you for this passage. Lord, I thank you for the warning that it lays out. I thank you for the way that it shows us how uh, you want to work in our lives. You want to work through our lives, but uh, we have to be workable. We have to have hearts that are soft and tender towards you. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would help us not to become callous towards you, that we would not become insensitive to your speaking in our lives, that, that we would be responsive. We thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Turn to hymn 424 as we sing together. Hymn 424. Take me now, Lord Jesus, take me. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us today, and it was a joy to be in the Lord's house. As we're dismissed, uh, Chris Radcliffe, would you mind dismissing us in prayer?